Mention um, a couple of times um, co-op things. That would probably be a good idea. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Yeah. Okay, so running in from here, etc. Okay, uh, really pleased to be talking with an old friend, uh, cooperative comrade, colleague, call him what you like, Vic Goddard, who's co-principal at Passmore's Academy with the wonderful Natalie. Uh, how is Natalie doing? Yeah, she's all right. It's been it's been tough. Which her family's been affected by COVID directly, so right. that's been that's been incredibly difficult for her and for for those of us who love her. So, it's been tough. Really sorry to hear that, but you know, best wishes and 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 um, remember her well from long ago in Ireland. So you know, just going back, we I think we said on the phone that we've known each other twenty two years. Is it? Yeah, really? about that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> it would have been twelve then. I guess. <laughs> I really wish twelve yeah. stone. I might have been then. I think, but not twelve. <laughs> yeah, so, so maybe just a little bit of um, the backdrop. I mean, you know, we we've both worked around Harlow, which is an amazing community and a town. Uh, lots and lots of really good things about it. Um, it's always had a bit of a history of doing itself down and not making the most mm. of all the good stuff. You know, there's the theatre. There's all the amenities, the sculpture and the art scene and the kids and the families, of course. So um, maybe I, I, I was just thinking, you know, go right back even further than that. I mean, you know, I wonder if you'd like to just sling your schoolboy memory right back to, you know, what, what were your <laughs> first days at school like? Can you remember anything that stands out? Um, primary school was, I mean, I, I, I went to schools that most of the families went to, you know, my brothers and sisters went to the same primary school. I followed, we had single sex schools in my part of South London. So I followed my brother to the, the all, my brother to the all boys school. So um, my, my path wasn't, wasn't sort of automatic, but it really was in some ways in the fact that, you know, we were a family that, you know, did things together. So my dad was chair of governors at my secondary school. My mum ran the PTA. And so, you know, from fairly humble beginnings, my dad was a plumber. Mum was, was, you know, stay at home looking after us, working incredibly hard but they were always involved in school. And I think that for me was such a, a starting point that's led to this point really in the fact that school was something that 
we did as a family, you know, did all the PTA stuff, did all those sorts of things. So, yeah, school was just part of everyday life, really, from Crystal being very little. Palace. Crystal Palace, was that part of family? Yeah. Too? Yeah, well, to be fair, it wasn't. I was um, Crystal Palace was my local team, but um, I put, Dad was an Arsenal fan. You know, my brother was a Chelsea fan. I had one other brother that's Crystal Palace fan, but it was um, yeah. But to be able to just a change, isn't it? You know, to be able to walk to the ground from home with your friends at the age of thirteen and stand to pay to stand directly behind the goal was definitely part of my uh, part of my growing up years. Magic, magic. So, so you know, I mean. I mean, I got into teaching by accident. Um, it, it, weirdly, I was supposed to be, um, I think, uh, heading off for Dublin uh, and having a, a, a life in the theatre. Like, you know, my family were theatre. Mum was, again, mm. single parent, halfway between a nursery teacher and an actress. And you know that she went on to do some quite amusing stuff in uh, soap operas and other things, probably. Um, but then, you know, the reason for me going to Dublin uh, left with somebody else. Uh, All right. So I ended up switching after doing an English degree, did the teaching at um, Goldsmiths, teach training. And my first job was in Tottenham, Broadwater Farm, which later went through all sorts of excitement and difficulties. So what were your first bits, um, where were your first teaching bits, Vic, and, and you know, early memories of teaching? I went to university on the South Coast, went to Chichester, um, which I, I loved and um, had four really good years there. And it happened, <clears throat> I guess, you know, if you're lucky, Final year teaching practice at a school. The school next door had um, had a job coming up, and um, I was very fortunate to get a job at Angring, which is just outside sort of Little Hampton, Little Hampton and Worthing. Um, and I I worked in an amazing PE department, head of PE, and and it was three male PE staff, of which I was one. Well, they were amazing role models, um, as were as were so many of the staff at that school. I had a really good start, um, a really good basis of you know rigor and you know all of those sorts of things alongside having the care for the young people so it was, it was a really good starting point yeah and then so you find your way into passmores eventually and and i can i can remember because we were both going through the phase when schools in the town were reorganized and uh one of the secondaries you know sadly you know was closing down but we got the opportunity to build the new passmores which was mm. i think a very very good investment, I say, looking back on it all and, and the de development of it, you know, it's a brilliant place. And I love the times I've walked through your front door and you can see all the corp values all mm. around the atrium, that nice central space, little sort of like a theatre hub and, and all the chat spaces. So I think, you know, obviously you've developed a really strong community. I mean, if you were going to say some of the things that you took from that into the famous Educating Essex, which bits do you think you know came through really well for you, and, and you you know you were pleased to see that in 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 the uh, fly in the wall series? Uh, I guess the the challenge of that was that you always wanted um, all stratas of your school to be represented. When you're going to go on national telly, you want your you want your head girl on there, and you want you know you want the mix. And I I think that was part of our naivety in doing it in the first place, John. If I'm honest, in the fact that we said yes to something that. We had no real idea what the final shape of it was going to be. You know, what was promised and what they thought they were going to get wasn't what they saw. They, you know, they expected um, the interesting stuff to be the children in, out of school and what that brings into school. And it didn't take long, just a couple of weeks for them to come in and go, actually, them out of school isn't very interesting. Them in school is really interesting. We want to do more of that. And, and I think what it gave me the opportunity to do more than anything else was to see um, staff interactions with some of our young people that I wouldn't have seen otherwise, you know, yeah, and that, obviously, that wraparound yeah. care and, you know, just the, the, the range of adults in the building that had relationships with children, you know, the cleaners, you know, chipping along the young person who wasn't, who wasn't doing the right thing, you know, all those sorts of things that, that whole, it's, it takes a village to raise a child. I get that, but it takes a, every adult to, to educate them as well in a building, not and it's not just down to their maths teacher. I think I learned that was a real, a real warm part of it for me. Yeah, no, I, th I think it came across. That came across really strongly. Lots of different uh, people in the team. I'm not obviously, you know, our, our good friend Stephen, mm. uh, you know, came through as. A, I mean, he in a way, he I think he plays a little bit to you know the character that he that he enjoys as a teacher. Um, 
yeah, just just sort of being both very clear, very very sort of directive, and and that's one of the strengths of any good teacher is kids know what they're getting, and and I think that came across as a whole from the school, the security that comes from that understanding and the relationships that are that are consistency. It's mm. all about consistency, isn't it? Always has been. I think that the, um, um, uh, we have a, a unconditional positive, positive regard is at the centre of what we think of young people, which you can Google it. Wikipedia is good for it, to be fair. Um, but it was about just accepting the fact that these young people will make mistakes in everything they do, not just their English and maths. And I think that that feeling of relentlessly picking them up, dusting them down, trying to educate them to not fall over again, but accepting the fact they were going to, I think that that whole... Um, ethos is so central to to how we work with young people and and really was with Steve Drew you know Steve was um you, you know he was he, he came across as bullshit and hard work and you know down the line and unforgiving but he was one of the most caring people you could ever see do you know what I mean and that and I wanted that part to come through halfway through episode one I was starting to panic and then you could see the softening of Stephen and and how children relied on him and how they trusted him you know, and that and that came back to consistency. You know, they knew what they were going to get with Stephen. They knew that they expected it. He expected right. them to do the right thing, but if they did the right thing, he would also reward them for that. And I think that's that was a really strong message about Stephen, but also about the school. I think completely. I mean, and, and probably most of us, in terms of people we respect or like or admire. I mean, if you're in public service, you'll tend to go for people who are consistent and and you can trust. You know, that's that's what it. I think it came across very well, and and it was obviously a good formula for Channel Four because they carried on with, you know, educating everywhere from, uh, you know, Yorkshire, East London, various other places. You know, yeah. Um, the only place they haven't done so far is educating the DFE, and I think, um, <laughs> and I'm taking you there next. To be honest. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> well, there's no point in, um, you know, avoiding it. I mean, I'm absolutely crystal clear. My view is that the Department for Education has been found wanting, uh, you know, completely not up to the task of supporting learning communities and realising from the word go. We, we put out messages last March, I think it was, saying you can cut back on all the guidance, you know, 51 guidance papers and counting. Kent County Council, bless them, put out a guidance to the guidance that ran to 150 pages. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it all gets into satire, doesn't it? Yeah. But we said right at the beginning that what the DFE should do and still needs to do is give schools a mandate and just say the board of governors or the academy board, whichever, and or the local authority have got the full empowerment to take the decisions they need to take and they will be given the resources, they'll be given the appropriate connections with health expertise, they will be empowered to protect children's opportunities and do the job well. And if that had been the step, my view anyway, that's that's mm. where it should have gone from the word go. And we're still not there because even in the last, as you say, you know, you, you can go to bed on a Sunday night and find you've missed three emails during the weekend as to what is the next story. So I'm probably not giving you a neutral question here. <laughs> but <laughs> what, what would you say, you know, what, what's your take on, on the last year um, and the, the way in which it's been managed and how have you managed and your team? So it's, it's a bit yeah. of a Tell it I like guess it it's interesting. I mean, we, you know, we're both, we're, the co-op is, is, you know, we're a cooperative academy. One of the, one of the first ones that when academization came up to, to, to go down the Memon Arts route with them. And actually the government could look to the co-op society for quite a lot of, quite a lot of ideas, you know, putting yeah. communities at the centre of decisions, you know, that's what you're saying, you know, that's that's what the, the, the co-op does, um, you know, accepting the fact that you can't do it without the, the workers, um, you know, yeah. and I think that's, I think there's been a big miss in that aspect where um, ruling by decree, centralised top-down decisions, you know, all of those things which they all rely on the human beings in the buildings to enact them, um, and if you're not going to listen to them and you're not going to show them trust, then they're going to they're gonna feel you know that that's not something they want to do so um trust and integrity have been are always the key in, in leadership generally um and there seems though both of those things seem to have been lacking and that's that's the biggest well you know the moment the dominant coming decisions coming decision was made you know 
I had parents saying to me, well, why do we need to follow the rules? You know, it's actually for a, for a prime minister who once said he was a details man, the details in the ramifications of decisions that have been made just haven't been thought through. You know, the, uh, you know, we're dealing with children. Everything you move is like a domino that affects something else. And I just, it's just been such, it's been such a shame that we've gone to, we've gone to policy by media, you know, let's leak something and see what the reaction is. And then we'll decide if it's the right thing to do. That's what it's felt like. Um, um, it's problematic when you work like that as well, because I mean, we both professionally have to keep an eye on social media. We have to use it both to communicate out and to receive, you know, what's going on a bit. But the trouble, well, there is a problem with social media in that it, it, it's so immediate. You know, look at what's happening in America this week. You know, and, and the master of social media, Donald over there. But, but the trouble with social media for me has always been that five seconds after something happens, everybody knows about it. 10 seconds, people have opinions. 25 seconds, there's an argument or yeah. confusion. And, and I, I absolutely agree with you that, you know, putting out info by social media or media in general, actually that's, a, it's almost like a betrayal of trust because you need to have good channels. So all the channels have been available, whether it's through, you, you set up Head Teachers Roundtable, for example, which is a melting pot of ideas. You know, there are groups, whether you go through the TUC education unions or through, you know, the Chartered College, whatever, there's plenty of channels, National Governance Association. The offers on the table, you know, are mounting up and mounting up and everybody's been, you know, we've all got the goodwill because we need to make this work. We know that. And this isn't just about having a pop at somebody politically. It's about, no, we're a public service and it's got to work just as the health service who... I, I find it incredible that they are still standing yeah, still unbelievable. under the same sort of occasional confusion or difficulty or convulsion. And yeah, I think the I think the the, the aspect of um, children are, children are why I do my job, you know, and they and yeah. they are absolutely um, the driving force in decisions we make. However. I'm really, really aware that the adults in the building are the ones that enact everything and they're the ones that actually make the biggest difference. As head teacher, my direct contact with the young people is less than, than their form tutor, than their history teacher. And actually the message that I want, I, I send more messages to the staff to say, look, what can we do to help? Is this working, et cetera? And that didn't happen to us. That didn't come down. We weren't trusted with those decisions. You know, I understand the government had a view around local authorities and, and lessening their impact and power. But actually, they were the they were one. They could have been the perfect body to to push this through. And I think Essex has been, you know, I've got a lot of respect for the leadership of Essex Education because they they tried so hard to communicate, and they've not always towed the party line, even though it's a very conservative um, area. Mm. So it's been they've had real they've had real um, authority, but also just trust that they they they're doing the right thing from a health perspective. You know, the lo the latest one for me, John, of the the mass testing with you know, the Public Health England and people saying the complete opposite to the FEI. We had an issue yesterday, but we phoned, we had a positive test within amongst the staff at one of our schools. We phoned up the DFE and said, what do we do? They said, well, with the contacts, just test and release. So if they're, if they're clear on the LF or the local flow test, they can stay in the school. We then phoned up the NHS line. They say, definitely don't do that. That would be a disaster for your school. So I've got two completely conflicting pieces of information from people who are supposed to be giving me the guidance. Now, Obviously, it's not it's not difficult. You follow well the health. You follow the health route. You keep people yes. safe and healthy, healthy, healthy. However, so that keeps me from killing somebody, and that's not being melodramatic. That right. keeps me from killing somebody, but it, it but it also puts me at risk of losing my job because I'm not following their guidance. You know, and that's I should and never that, be put in that position. That, that's, that's completely unacceptable in putting people who have, you know, I mean, I've always, another little thing for me has always been the difference between accountability and responsibility. Accountability is something put on you. Responsibility is you step forward and you're willing to take it. And that, that's what leadership is and always has been. And when you're actually not getting the support for that, it, it, it's, it's not good. And, and hopefully you won't be um, in court for any outbursts of anger, but I, I understand. What would you ask? people like our network, I mean, what else do you think we could do straight? You know, so if we're not doing a good enough job, one of the reasons for this conversation and, you know, taking stock, 2020 hindsight, what have we learned? Um, we want to go forward into 21 with, we will have our values 
and our principles intact, we are seeing unbelievable work in learning communities across the country. Um, and I think, you know, you, you fly the flag and you represent thoughtful, reflective, honest school provision. And it, but what would you like to see us do? Is there anything else we can do? We are ramping up the lobbying, you'll be surprised mm. to hear, and trying to get the message out there that, you know, we need to take a step back and go to trust, empowerment, facilitation of what is possible, not, you know, edict, as, you, as we both said from the centre. What would you like us to do? I think that the co-op has a, a fairly unique position in some ways in the fact that it has such a diverse range of schools mm. and therefore such a diverse range of communities. And I think the message that the government has to hear is central decree, you know, so responsibility for decisions centrally, but accountability locally just doesn't work. You know, and the reality is that a decision you make for one school will be different from another purely because of the shape of their corridors or how many children go on buses or anything else. The, the unique individuality of the community can be something incredibly simple. How many doors into a building have you got? In which case that will, that will affect how many children you can have coming in and out at once. I think getting the government to listen to that, you know, this we have, we, we, we represent all of these schools and, in, and that, that decision in this school will, will, will do this thing and that decision in this school will do something completely different. And they, I don't think they understand that. I don't think they understand what they use the language of we're going to remote education, everything's going online. When you're in a family, you're in a school where 38% of your families haven't got access to online at home, that decision is a really stressful one. And therefore, you know, that needs to be taken into account. So that, that voice of a diverse range of schools, I think is something the co-op can, can, can and I'm sure is doing lots of. Well, I, I, thanks for that. And I think we'll take that as an encouragement to ramp up the volume of it. Um, in a way, it's that balancing act for us because we're really conscious of, of the strains and the, and the job that people are doing. And it's, it, you know, we're not here to make life more complicated mm. because apparently there are some experts in making life complicated already in the field. So <laughs> let's leave that to them. Because um, life's complicated enough. That, I think that was actually a, it might have been a co-op or it might have been a motoring organisation. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think that's lovely, Vic. And, and probably what would be nice to round off with. So we've got a message to, the, to ourselves and possibly one to the DfE. Um, Two things I'd like to ask you to finish off with, and, and that'd be a really nice little chunk of conversation. Thank you. It would be great to know who out there at the moment you find inspired. I've got a guess that it, it might be in a sports profession, but there yeah. have been some inspiring people who are doing brilliant stuff. So I'd like two little things to round off, Vic. One would be who has actually inspired you? Who, who are you looking at and thinking, wow, that's great. That, that helps me to keep going. And secondly, if you want to fa finish off with just a greeting to your own learning community, which we'd be happy to put out and say, well done to Passmore's, the whole family of schools that you look after. We wish you well. So over to you. Who do you, who do you think deserves a bit of a well done you? You, you, you know the answer to, to, to the first one. And, you know, we have, a, we have a mural in our heart space. It's sort of 20 metres square of Marcus Rashford. Okay. Um, I think, you know, what was, from a personal perspective, the fact that we were banging on about that probably for a month or so before Mr. Ashford got involved um, and we're getting nowhere. And the fact that he used what he had, which was, you know, that, that influence with government, because of main, mainly because of social media, let's be honest, but for other reasons, uh, that he used that in such a way when he didn't need to. Um, yeah. and, and interestingly, you know, we were contacted by, by his uh, management team to say, we're aware that you've been banging on about this for a while. Let's, what can we do to help, you know, get that elevated, you know, and, our, and it's led to opportunities for our young people. His Black Lives Matters football boots that he wore, our young people helped design those. You know, that's, that's been remarkable. Um, so just somebody who, you know, from anybody that goes out of their way to do something they don't need to do, that's, that's for, the, for the benefit of other people, needs to be, needs to be held a high, you know, and, and he's done that remarkably. So, um, I hope one day, once the pandemic's down, you'll come down and see his mural in person because it's uh, it, it, sends, it sends the right message. You want the autograph on it, don't you? Absolutely, really? yeah, absolutely. But it's that 
without a shadow of a doubt, it's he he stands out in a crowd in a in a in a busy field of people that have done amazing things. He definitely stands out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. With regard to with regard to our community, I mean, um, as you, you know, you've already said it. I work in a, a remarkable place. You know, Harlow is a fantastic town. It doesn't do itself justice sometimes, um, and certainly the portrayal of it is, you know. When you when you get films of the, the worst high street in the country and they film it in Harlow, you know you think yeah. actually that's that's just that's just rude and it's not necessary. So um, I, 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 for me, we're all parts of this jigsaw. And and you know I said it earlier that it takes a village to raise a child. That really is the case, and it never it's never been more more noticeable than right now, where we're providing stuff for people at home that we're expecting families to be able to cope with, um, both from a from a learning perspective, trying to keep their young people learning, but from a mental health and well-being perspective. So from, I guess that the only message to go is, you know, that it does feel, and I've started to feel there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So um, I think that'd be my message. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. If we still work together, we'll make it through it. Brilliant. It's lovely, it's lovely speaking with you. It's really nice and to you. And one day we'll catch up in person <laughs> and I will, I, I hope so. I saw two and it's been great to have you with us. Thanks very much, Vic, and Thanks, uh, John. talk soon.